Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we'll start with question number one from Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether an island's impact assessment was carried out when it removed the water and sewage charges exemption for charitable bodies such as public community halls. Minister Mary Goujon. No island's impact assessment was carried out as that wasn't required when the scheme was renewed in 2015. All organisations which were no longer eligible for that exemption following the renewal of the scheme were provided with a two-year transitionary period to help adjust to those changes. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister accept that community public halls are run by volunteers on a not-for-profit basis where their bar income is reinvested in a facility for nursery classes, youth clubs and community events, not competing with pubs? Does she understand, therefore, that removing the water relief is costing some Shetland halls £2,000 a year and could close the doors for these essential community buildings? Therefore, will the government conduct an island's impact assessment and reinstate this very necessary rates uh, exemption? Minister. Uh, thank you. I completely understand the concerns that, that the member raises there. Um, but... I, I would say that in terms of a community impact assessment, now there are provisions within the Islands Act 2018, um, but the provisions relating to the implementation of the island communities impact assessments haven't yet been commenced. But when those do, and when those provisions do commence, we could consider a, a retrospective uh, impact assessment if we receive, we then receive that qualifying request from a local authority. So I, I hope that answers his questions, but if he does require any further information than that, and I'm sure the, the Cabinet Secretary would, would welcome a, a discussion with him. Thank you. Question number two, Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it had with Police Scotland regarding the reported list of flags that it could be a criminal offence to fly. Cabinet Secretary, Hamza Youssef. Well, this is an operational matter for Police Scotland, which is confirmed, uh, who have confirmed that the list of flags was produced to assist officers in differentiating between uh, legitimate flags uh, and those that include illegal images such as symbols of proscribed terrorist organisations. Uh, Police Scotland has clearly confirmed that in the absence of other associated criminal behaviour, it is not illegal to fly any national flag in its unaltered state. Sandra White. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that some of these flags is a national flag of Ireland and even the Vatican City, Israeli flag, Palestinian flags also. So perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could speak to Police Scotland and provide details of who created the flags and the rationale, as he's already mentioned, behind it, uh, particularly because it says in the, in the minutes oh, that I've received, it's inferred that if these flags are flown or displayed in a provocative manner, I'd like to know who defines provocative, would be subject to Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act. Well, I'll try to give some, some reassurance to the member. I also have the guidance in front of me, and, and the flags that she actually referenced in her question, they come under the heading, and I'll, I'll read it out directly from the guidance, uh, quote-unquote, flags which do not in themselves constitute criminality. Uh, the document and, and the flags contained within, of course, uh, are very much prepared by Police Scotland and for Police Scotland uh, to determine. So trying to give some further reassurance. Uh, when she asked the question around uh, you know, provocative uh, and, and who is that to judge? Well, it is very much uh, within the laws and within the statute. I think she would recognise that, for example, uh, any threatening gestures uh, or so on and so forth could lead uh, to some uh, criminal offences under the appropriate uh, pieces of legislation. But, uh, of course, if she has any further questions, I'm more than happy to provide Sandra White with details of Police Scotland, who she can correspond with directly. And James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's simply unacceptable that uh, flags which demonstrate religious and political beliefs, um, should, the use of those flags should be restricted and it's a breach of civil liberties. It's outrageous that the Vatican flag can be considered one which might get, some, waving, might get somebody criminalised. Um, can the Minister, can the Cabinet Secretary make clear to Police Scotland that as lawmakers of the Scottish Parliament, we find it deeply offensive uh, deeply offensive and unacceptable that uh, such flags are listed and that there are breach, people's civil liberties have been breached. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I do my best to give uh, James Kelly the, the benefit of the doubt that maybe he hasn't read the guidance uh, in detail? The guidance says, and I repeat once again, as I did in my previous answer, 
that flying the Vatican flag in its unaltered state, and that is important, its unaltered state, the original Vatican flag, uh, flying that would not be in itself uh, a, a criminal. Uh, and Police Scotland have said that and are happy for me uh, to say that. Uh, there are particular offences, uh, that, 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 there are particular actions, I should say, uh, that could uh, make that an offence, as in altering that flag. It would be the same with any other uh, national flag. Now, he and I both know, being uh, attendees at football matches, that we have seen flags that have been altered, potentially with uh, those uh, organisations that are prescribed under the Terrorism uh, Act. Now, now, as I say, uh, national flags such as the Vatican flag being flown uh, unaltered in its unaltered state would not in itself uh, 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 be a criminal offence. And I hope I can give that reassurance to, to James Kelly and others too. Question number three, Murdoch Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what efforts it is making to improve international transport connectivity. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Improving Scotland's international air connectivity is one of this government's top priorities and it will help build stronger business links and provide a real boost to our tourism industry. Our support has helped Scotland's airports secure new routes to other parts of the UK, Europe, the Middle East, North America and China, including Emirates' new service from Edinburgh to Dubai. The Scottish Government will continue to promote Scotland as a destination which can sustain more direct air services and better global hub connectivity. And we will work with Scotland's airports to achieve these objectives. On international ferry links, the Scottish Government will welcome, would welcome international ferry services to Scotland. These would have to operate on a commercially viable basis and would be for ferry operators to consider. We work closely with Scottish Enterprise, Visit Scotland, and any ports, ferry operators and other partners potentially involved in new commercially viable ferry routes to Europe. Murdoch Fraser. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, that response? Uh, two weeks ago, the low-cost air carrier Norwegian announced it was pulling out of their transatlantic flights from Edinburgh, citing the Scottish Government's failure to deliver a cut in air passenger taxes uh, as the reason. Now, we know that there are legal issues uh, to be overcome around the devolution of APD, uh, but the Treasury has signalled its willingness to work with the Scottish Government to try and overcome these. So, is the Scottish Government still committed to a cut in air taxes? And if so, when can we expect to see some progress on this before further routes are lost? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the member raises uh, an important point and it was uh, disappointing to see the flights uh, uh, withdraw from Edinburgh Airport uh, in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, the issue of uh, ADT is a matter which has been getting pursued by my uh, ministerial colleague Derek Mackay for a considerable period of time now uh, and has raised this matter with the Treasury to address what is a defective tax in the way in which the power has been passed to the Scottish Government and that matter has to be addressed. Uh, my uh, colleague continues to pursue the Treasury to seek to have this matter addressed and as soon as it is addressed we will be in a position to take forward our policy and that is to uh, see a 50% reduction in ADT uh, and to have it completely removed when budgets are available. But of course the UK Government uh, could take action on this matter on the 29th of October mm. when the budget is going to be announced and I hope the member will be pressing the Chancellor to take action on ADT in the coming weeks. Question number four, Jamie Green. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve accessibility at railway stations. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. There are 359 stations and 254 of these are wheelchair accessible, 45 more than in 2007. Of the 105 remaining, 75 of these stations are inaccessible to both platforms, whilst 30 of them provide access to one platform. For inaccessible stations, ScotRail provides appropriate alternative transport for disabled passengers at no extra charge between the inaccessible station and the nearest or most convenient accessible station for their journey. Uh, rail accessibility is a UK government reserved matter. Uh, the Department for Transport is currently considering the Scottish Government's proposal for accessibility funding and projects for the next five years. Uh, the Scottish Government remain committed to improving access at stations beyond the UK Government's programme. For example, the Scottish Government will fund accessibility work at Portlochray and Aviemore stations 
as part of the Highland Mainline project. Jamie Green. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, very informative uh, response. Uh, as he said, a number of stations are completely inaccessible to disabled users. For example, uh, Burnt Island in the Fife Circle, which sees 230,000 passengers a year, but is only available to disabled people on the northbound service, not the southbound service. It's something which seems quite, quite ludicrous. Now, I appreciate the real estate is owned by Network Rail, but Network Rail is also part of the Scott Rail Alliance. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he will press upon the Alliance the need uh, to continue to improve accessibility right across Scotland so that our rail network is truly open and accessible for as many users as possible. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the uh, uh, access um, uh, for all programme in order to improve accessibility at train stations is a matter for the Department of Transport at the UK Government as it is a reserved area. We continue to work with them in order to look at where further improvements can be made and we are going through a programme of work with them at the present moment to identify other stations within the Scottish network that they, we believe they should provide resources for in order to improve accessibility. That work is due to be completed by 2019 and I hope that the Department of Transport will listen to the recommendations and views of the Scottish Government in taking us forward, including uh, issues relating to the <laughs> station at Burn Island, where we have the opportunity through modernisation work which has been taken forward by the Scottish Government, we are taking the opportunity to make accessibility improvements to stations where that can be achieved through Scottish Government funding. But it's certainly the case, it's a matter that the Department of Transport at UK level have to take more action on in order to deal with the backlog of stations that don't presently have adequate accessibility. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm glad to see Burnt Island station being raised. And as a Fife MSP, I would like to emphasise that it is a station that continues to have very poor accessibility. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the high percentage of stations across Fife that perform poorly in terms of accessibility? And does he agree that Fife should be a priority in any additional funds going forward? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the important element here in terms of the funding of this is for the Department of Transport to allocate funding that allows that work to be undertaken. What we are doing is, um, uh, and the work that we have been undertaking within Transport Scotland is to identify stations where there are continuing accessibility matters that need to be addressed. Uh, that will include those in the Fife area that don't have adequate accessibility for uh, individuals with a mobility issue in order to make sure that the UK Government are aware of that. What will then happen is that the UK Government will then determine which stations will then have access improvement work taken forward. Uh, and that will be set out in 2019. But we are ensuring that the Department of Transport are very much aware of the concerns we have around the range of stations in Scotland that need to have accessibility improvements carried out very quickly. Question number five, Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last had talks with the UK Immigration Minister. Minister Ben McPherson. During the summer recess, both myself and the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government had introductory meetings with the UK Immigration Minister, Caroline Noakes. During my meeting, I expressed the Scottish Government's deep concerns to her about UK policy on immigration. But while we uh, hold profoundly different positions, I hope to work professionally and constructively with Ms Noakes to ensure that the rights of EU citizens in Scotland are protected and that Scotland's needs on migration and population are met in future policy. Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you for that answer. Does the Minister agree with me that the fees charged to UK-born children of migrants who register as British citizens should be scrapped or drastically reduced? The current fee is £1,012, with £372 going on administrative costs and £640 profit for the Home Office. Is this not simply immoral profiteering? Minister. It's clear that current UK immigration policy is simply not appropriate for Scotland. The current costs are prohibitively expensive, as has been articulated, preventing eligible children from applying for British citizenship. Indeed, Stuart Macdonald MP highlighted this very issue in a Westminster debate last month. The immigration system should be easy to access and focused on what a prospective migrant will contribute, not on their ability to pay. Therefore, any fees and charges should be proportionate. People who choose to make their lives in Scotland are our friends and our neighbours. They strengthen our society and we welcome them. We need an immigration system that values their contribution to Scotland, that is fair and compassionate 
and puts people first. And this government will continue to argue for that in stark contrast and opposition to the UK government's hostile environment policy. Question number 16, Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of staff shortages on local fire services. Minister Ashton. Operational decisions, including the deployment of firefighters and other staff, are a matter for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. SFRS staff play a vital role in protecting our communities and are continuing to deliver the high standard of services required to keep Scotland safe. In the budget for 2018-19, the Scottish Government increased the spending capacity of the SFRS by £15.5 million. And this includes providing £5.5 million extra direct funding and ensuring they keep the £10 million pounds from, in full from VAT costs to invest in transformation plans. And we will continue to press the UK Government to return the £50 million pounds paid to the HMRC since 2013 because Scotland is the only fire service in the UK to have paid this unfair Tory tax. Dean Lockhart. Uh, I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, I, I would say that... Uh, <laughs> The, the SNP reformed the fire service in full knowledge of the financial implications of doing so. But let me, I would rather focus on the needs of my constituents in my region. So can I ask uh, the Minister, last week I met with the senior fire officer for the Stirling, Stirling region following reports that the city's second fire appliance has been un unavailable a number of times this year as a result of staff shortages. The team at Stirling Fire and Rescue are doing all they can to address these issues, but notwithstanding what the Minister has said, this will take time. So what assurances can the Minister give to people in the Stirling region that they will have adequate fire cover while these staff shortfalls are dealt with? Minister. Fire appliances can only be safely deployed if there is a full crew available. And there can be instances where appliances are off the run when crewing levels fall short through either unplanned absence, such as sick leave, or planned activities, such as crew training in specialist activities or new equipment. SFRS use a variety of methods to ensure that a fully planned and safe level of coverage is maintained at all times. And this includes offering overtime to cover short-term staff absence and bringing crews in from other fire stations. And this is normal practice for any fire and rescue services. And I would like to reassure the member that there have been no instances where the SFRS did not respond to an incident without the appropriate level of resources. Question number seven, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to provide flexibility for recipients of universal credit. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. Since 4th October 2017, the Scottish Government has given people in Scotland the option to receive their universal credit payment monthly or twice monthly and to have any housing costs in their award paid directly to their landlord. This gives people more control and flexibility over how they manage their household budget in a way that best suits their particular circumstances. Let me be clear, though, that universal credit is an entirely reserved benefit, and this is one which we have very limited flexibilities over. As our report published this week on the impact of the UK government's welfare reform highlights, universal credit is causing hardship and deprivation and is not fit for purpose. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Based on the evidence of impacts we've seen in other areas of Scotland where universal credit has been introduced. I'm very concerned that constituents of mine are going to face even further hardship. Does the Scottish Government agree with me that the UK Government should take heed of the evidence and listen to organisations supporting the most vulnerable people in society and halt this thrombolic and fatally flawed system? Cabinet Secretary. Well, absolutely. We have repeatedly urged the UK government to halt the rollout of universal credit, as have many organisations, and we have been repeatedly refused. The UK government chooses to ignore the mounting evidence of the sharp increase in food bank use and in rare years in universal credit full service areas. And universal credit is being rolled out to Scotland's largest cities this year. I am also very concerned, as the member is, about the impact it will have. Causal evidence shows housing arrears in full service areas are more than two and a half times the arrears for those on housing benefit. The Trussell Trust analysis shows food back demand increases in full service areas by 52% in the year of our rollout. Despite this and the other evidence, the UK government is ignoring our calls. However, it is not too late for them to realise the impact of this damaging policy 
one which is undoubtedly driving people into debt and arrears and causing extreme anxiety and distress for many people across this country.